Welcome to First Baptist Sparta, and thank you for watching our worship service online. We hope that the hearing of the Word today leaves your faith strengthened and encouraged, and we hope that you'll make plans to come visit us in person soon. For more information about the church, you can either contact the church directly or visit SpartaFirstBaptist.com. If you've got your Bibles, you can open them up to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7 this morning as we continue our study through the book of Acts. Now as we've been going along in this journey through the first five chapters of Acts and continuing with what we see this morning, you're, you're probably starting to realize that the church in Jerusalem, the church that we've seen in the first five and now six chapters of Acts, they are facing all kinds of problems, right? all, all kinds of issues. Ever since we got to Acts 4, in fact, every passage, the church is tackling a different issue, a different problem. They're having to deal with persecution from the Jewish officials. They're having to deal with sin in the church, with Ananias and Sapphira. And today, we see them dealing with disputes and divisions. Now, if you've been around church long enough, maybe you're not surprised by that. Right? You already know in your head, brother, it ain't no secret that there are problems in the church. In fact, you might be sitting next to one of them right now. <laughs> but for others of you, others of you, everyone's looking to their left and to their right. I'll give you names after. One of them, one of them right there. to the church, and you may, may expect to find in the church just a, a community of, of loving people, kind people who will never disappoint you, this amazing group of people with no problems, and I've just got news for you this morning, keep looking, because what Acts teaches us is that this isn't just something that exists in our church, this is something that exists in every church, that if you're in any church long enough, you're going to find some problems. Someone's going to sin against you. You're going to be disappointed by people. There's going to be a decision made by the, the pastor or the leaders that you're going to disagree with. You might even feel neglected or forgotten at times. right? We're, we aren't a perfect people. In fact, that's why we're here. Is to celebrate and worship the only perfect one who rescues us from our imperfections. So listen. The, the presence of problems in a church isn't a problem. The presence of problems isn't a problem. It's just a reality. That's life in a fallen, broken world. It's how we handle those problems as a church that makes the difference and makes us the distinct people of God that He has saved us and called us to be. And that's the beauty of the passage we're looking at this morning. We get to watch as the church masterfully handles a problem that protects it from division. Everyone knows Jerry's a problem. Right? <laughs> Colby knows Jerry's a problem. We all get to watch as Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, shows us this problem in the church and how the church deals with this. So stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because there were widows being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. 
And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would guide us by your spirit into understanding and application of this truth. And that you would help us to use this as a template, as a church. To not live in the space of complaint and problem finding. But to use wisdom Wisdom from the Holy Spirit and wisdom from the Word to solve the problems that allow us to focus on the mission, to make disciples of all nations. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you. So here's the main idea of the passage this morning. Different offices of church leaders, different offices of church leaders minister in different ways so that the church can remain healthy as it grows. I think we would all acknowledge growth is painful. Growth is painful. Just ask any kid or any teenager in the middle of their growth spurt. You may know kids who struggle to, to run or even struggle to walk because the growing pains in their legs are so severe. Well, this is not only true in our physical bodies. It's also true in our collective corporate body. Growth is painful because growth requires change, and change is disruptive. Right? As our family grew from one child to two, to three, to four, and now we're done. <laughs> As our family grew with, with each new child, we were always a little bit worried and concerned about how it would affect the other kids that we already had. Right? Are they going to be jealous of the attention that the baby's getting? Are they going to be thrown off by the shift in schedules? Are they going to be thrown off by having to, to change rooms? Like, Charlie got to enjoy his own room for about two and a half years. And then when Jane was born, he got moved into the room with his two older sisters. It was disruptive. So growth requires change, and change is disruptive. It's painful. In fact, we've already experienced similar things here at First Baptist. With the growing number of infants and toddlers that we had in the church, we had to ask... JD's Sunday school class to move out of their old room so we could turn it into a nursery. And they did it with joy. They did, which I appreciated. Growth also brought about change in our staffing. We added another full-time position in, in Colby's role. And Lord willing, growth is going to bring about change in our facilities over the next couple of years. And what we see in the book of Acts this morning is that this is not a new problem. Churches have been dealing with the pain of growth for literally thousands of years. When the church grows, it introduces new problems that require new solutions so we can be good stewards of God's people, whether he brings us ten or a hundred or a thousand. One commentator put it this way, churches with the right priorities are always willing to find the right solutions that allow them to prioritize the right things. They will not be defensive, defending the status quo, but offensive, looking for creative solutions. And that's what we see from the apostles and from the church in Acts chapter 6. So, so one of the things I want you to notice as we work through the passage is notice the role of the congregation as a whole. Right? They see the problem and they bring it to the attention of the apostles. And then notice the apostles who don't get defensive when criticism comes their way, but they try to find a solution to a legitimate issue. And then notice these newly appointed servants who embrace the new ministry. They sacrifice of their time to embrace the new ministry for the health of the whole body. So, point number one. Unintentional offense and accidental oversight threaten the unity and health of the church. Now I want to emphasize these words, unintentional and accidental. All right, it is clear from verse one that this was an unintentional offense. The apostles didn't mean to leave out this group of widows from the daily distribution. It was an accident. And in my limited experience, the vast majority of conflict and issues that arise within the church are accidental, unintentional. Like, I forgot to write down the name of a prayer request at a prayer meeting. And someone went to the hospital and no one knew. And they didn't get visited. That's an accident. That's an unintentional offense. Or let's say that you say something to someone and they take it the wrong way. 
And now they're upset about something that you didn't even mean. Right? Anybody, everybody raise their hand. We've all been through that in the church or at home. Or you come to Wednesday night dinner and you just happen accidentally. You don't, you don't know any better. And you sit at a table that no one normally sits at. And so you eat alone. And you think to yourself, that is the meanest church I've ever been to. I am never going back. <laughs> there are countless ways that we unintentionally offend each other with accidental oversights. But here's what this passage teaches. We can't let those things create division and disunity among us. The apostles didn't know the widows were being left out. And once they did, they did something about it. So let's just make sure that there is a multitude of grace in our church that leaves space for unintentional offenses and accidental oversights. We don't need to get angry. We don't need to assume the worst about each other. We don't need to storm off and, and leave the church over a misunderstanding. If there's an issue, bring it to the surface. And that's what we see happening in verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So, so here in verse 1, we, we see the problem. All right? And the problem is actually multi-layered. The first layer is that it's a logistical problem. All right, we can assume, based on what we read, that the church had a system and a process that provided for widows who couldn't provide for themselves. But, but apparently, the church's system needs to be reevaluated. Why? Because the growth of the church was overwhelming the system. And because of the growth, there's this group of widows being overlooked and neglected. So it's a simple administrative oversight. It's a logistical error. But here's what made the problem worse. This logistical oversight aligned with a natural division that already existed in the church. So in first century Israel, there were two major categories of Jews. We see them there in verse 1. On the one hand, you have the Hebrews. Right? These are the Jewish people who are from Israel. They've lived in Israel. They've maintained their Jewish heritage and customs. And they speak the Hebrew language. That's why they're called Hebrews. On the other hand, you have this group called the Hellenists. These are people who are ethnically Jewish. They are from the people of Israel. But they've more or less forsaken their Jewish heritage. They've spent time living outside the nation of Israel and the surrounding nations. And so Greek was their primary language, not Hebrew. They had stopped practicing some of the Jewish customs and culture and adopted a more, quote-unquote, modern Greek culture. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that the synagogues in Israel were divided in two. There were Hebrew synagogues and Hellenist synagogues, where Greek was spoken and where Hebrew was spoken. Now, they're all Christians in Acts chapter 6, but they're Christians from very different backgrounds. So there's this natural division that already existed in the church, and it is accentuated by the administrative oversight. It's got me thinking about natural divisions our church, in, in our church. And I want you to raise your hands if this is true of you. How many of you, by show of hands, were born in Allegheny County or, or have lived here for more than 25 years? Raise your hand. Born in Allegheny, okay, what, 50 to 60 percent? How many of you, oh, by the way, we're going to call you, no offense, we're going to call you the old timers, all right? All right. Born in Allegheny or been here longer than 25 years. All right. How many of you have lived here less than five years? Less than five years. Raise your hand. Pretty good number. Pretty good number. All right. We're going to call you the newcomers. The newcomers. Not, not as offensive. So there's this natural division in our church. Right? Now imagine if all the newcomers were the ones being left out of the ministry. Don't you think some newcomers would start asking questions? Hey, Pastor Matt, have you noticed at family night dinners that when we, when the newcomers get up to eat, all the food is gone? <laughs> hey, Pastor Matt, did, did you notice that none of us newcomers were given the date for the directory pictures? We just got completely left out of the directory. 
So if, if the administrative oversight aligned with a natural division in the church, there would start to be some questions, right? So, so this is actually a serious problem for the first century church. It could wreck their unity. And by wrecking their unity, it could wreck their witness to the outside world. One commentator said, distinctions between people cannot be maintained and supported in a church that confesses a Christ who's come to give God's grace to all types of people. Another one wrote, this situation is important for revealing the church's character and credibility. Is the church a place where concern is met with action, regardless of who brings it? So what are the apostles going to do with this problem? How, how are they going to respond? Now first, I want you to think about all the ways they could have responded. They could have said, how dare you criticize us? We're out here preaching the gospel. Didn't you see what just happened? We got arrested and beaten. And you didn't see us complaining. Why are you complaining? Now, thankfully, they, they don't have that kind of self-centered, egotistical victim complex that some leaders have. <clears throat> or maybe they could have said, hey, quit your complaining. We got bigger fish to fry. Like, didn't you hear the mission Jesus gave us? We're supposed to proclaim his name from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Don't you realize how many people need to hear the gospel? And some Christian leaders have that kind of heartless, compassionless leadership that looks past the needs of people to the fulfillment of a grander vision. But that's also not what we see from the apostles. Or maybe they could have said, why are you so worried about your needs? Don't you realize the church is supposed to focus on other people's needs? Why don't you meet someone else's need for a change? But no, there's not that critical, shaming attitude toward the church. Now the reason I, I mention these kinds of responses is because these are all things that pastors, myself included, feel. I can be guilty of feeling that way towards the church. It's the dark side of ministry leadership. Where if one more complaint, one more problem gets brought to my attention, I'm going to explode. All pastors struggle with this at times, and it can make us heartless and jaded toward the people we serve. And it is unhealthy, and it is ungodly, and pastors are guilty of it, and I'm guilty of it. So what we see from these apostles is this wonderful and wise example. Right? They show compassionate concern for the need, so they prioritize the need. the need. The widows need to be fed. But they do it in a way so that they don't lose their primary focus on preaching prayer and gospel proclamation. Point number two. A multitude of ministry requires a multiplicity of leaders. Verse two. And the twelve, twelve apostles, they summon the full number of the disciples. So they call a church business meeting. This is going to be something for the whole church to sort out. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, at first glance, it might sound like the, the apostles have a superiority complex. Right? The, the word here for serve tables is the Greek word diakonos. It means servant. That's where we get the word deacon from, by the way. So it might look like the apostles are saying, hey, we're too good to serve tables. We're above that. You find someone else to do that. But the reason we know that that's not the kind of spirit the apostles bring into this situation is because Jesus, the greatest of all, identified himself as a servant. A diakonos. Mark 10, 45. I came not to be served, but to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the ultimate servant. Who descended from the glories of heaven to suffer and die in an act of sacrificial service and sacrificial love for sinful humanity. Service, Jesus says, is what makes one great in the kingdom of heaven. And so this isn't about superiority or inferiority. It's about priority. 
priority. The apostles realized there's a bad way to solve this problem. There's a bad way to solve this problem. In fact, it's possible to solve this problem in a way that only creates another problem. You ever done that? Man, it stinks. I thought I fixed it, but I made it worse over here. Here's what the apostles realized. They realized there's more than one way to be a servant of the church. There are two broad categories of ministry, and both of them are essential to life in the church. The first is that the church has physical needs and must be served physically. In other words, the widows need their food. The Brenegers need financial support. People need water. People need clothes. But in addition to the physical needs, the church also has spiritual needs and must be fed spiritually. And so both of these needs are so essential to the health of the church and so time-consuming in nature that to choose one and neglect the other would lead to disaster. And so what do the apostles suggest? They suggest that the church create multiple categories of leadership so that both needs are met. So the apostles will focus primarily on spiritual needs. They say preaching and prayer. Jesus said, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? To, to truly live as God designed us. We, we aren't just physical beings. We're spiritual beings. We need more than just physical food. We need spiritual food to feast on the word of God. And if you were preparing a home-cooked meal for your whole family who was coming over for lunch after church, how long would it take? Anybody? Hours. And even before you start preparing it, you're thinking about it all week. Right? When do I need to go to the store? When do I need to let this start to thaw? That is just the worst thing, isn't it? When you've got plans to make something, you realize it's still frozen. You didn't let it thaw. When do I need to put this in the oven? Right? This, this, it takes hours and hours to prepare a big meal to feed a big family. And it takes hours and hours to prepare a substantive sermon that feeds God's people. I heard a story in my preparation this week. It said there was an older seasoned pastor who was just an anointed, gifted preacher. And after preaching the house down one Sunday morning, this young man in this congregation came up to him. And he said, man, I would give anything. I would give my life to be able to preach like that. To which the pastor said, good, because that's what it'll take. <laughs> Teaching and preaching and the prayer and spiritual preparation that goes into it, it is an all-consuming task. And just like your family can tell when you're serving up cheap, microwavable dinners, the church can tell when the pastor is serving up cheap, sugary sermons without any substance. And any pastor that's serious about his calling won't be content leaving God's people malnourished. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Jesus tells Peter, feed my sheep. Scripture is the source of our spiritual life as the body of Christ. And spirit-filled preaching puts wind in the sails of our ministry. So it is not right, they say that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, preaching and prayer is not the only task of a pastor, but it is a primary task. And to be honest, I think the reason a lot of churches, especially smaller churches, struggle is because they're asking their pastor to do it all, to preach and to pray and to counsel and to visit and to serve the tables, to meet all the spiritual needs of the church and all the physical needs of the church. And with too much weight on one person, that the body isn't healthy. The body's not getting fed. Now, if I could just pause and appreciate you for a minute, that is not what it's like to pastor here. Without a doubt, one of the reasons, I think, for this season of growth in our church is because we have people who are willing to step up and serve the body. And we have deacons. We have Sunday school teachers. We have committees. We have small group leaders. We have people that deliver meals to shut-ins, we have nursery volunteers, we have all kinds of people doing all kinds of things, and when both the physical ministries of the church and the spiritual ministries of the church are getting the attention, getting the attention they need, the church grows and is healthy. By God's grace, that's what's happening right now. 
So the apostles refused to set aside the spiritual health of the church, but they also refused to neglect the legitimate physical needs. Right? So, so what do they do? Verse 3. Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So they appoint seven men, but not just any, not just any seven men. Right? Seven men who fit a certain criteria. Now most scholars believe that this is the beginning of the office of deacon. Right? We don't have to limit it to that, but there's pretty compelling evidence that that's the case. But here's what's interesting about these seven men. They're spiritual. Right? They're spiritual men. Look at the criteria for being appointed to this duty. Number one, you've got to have a good reputation. So you're trustworthy. Number two, you've got to be full of the Holy Spirit. So, so your life is not dominated by the flesh. It's dominated by the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit. And number three, you've got to be wise. You can't be immature. You can't be a fool. Another way to say this is that the church was electing people into leadership based on character, not charisma. It's not about popularity. It's not about personality. It's not about tenure. It's not about networking and community connections. It's about character and godliness. Like if you don't check that box, we don't care how funny you are or how charming you are or how winsome or well-networked or successful you are. We want godly spiritual people providing leadership in the church. If you've got a great personality, it's an added bonus. But it's, it's not a prerequisite. Now, now, given the criteria, here's, here's a question. It's a good question. Why does it require spiritually mature people to do administrative tasks in the church? Like if the primary task of these men was going to be making spreadsheets and, and organizing the collections of the church and distributing those collections to the widows, like that's all administrative. So why do they need to be spiritually mature people? Here's why. Because every act of service in the church is spiritual service. Like when they handed out the food to the widows, you don't just want them handing out food. Next, next, next. Get, get through here, Betty. Next. <laughs> the widows aren't parts on an assembly line. Right? They're people. So you want to see these men loving people, caring for people. You want them to have the discernment to, to read their faces and see what's going on beneath the surface. Hey, you, you seem a little down today. Is everything okay? How can I pray for you? You want them to have the, the knowledge and the words to encourage and comfort them with truth from God's word. And the same is true for anyone serving in any capacity in the church, right? All service is spiritual service. So when you're watching the kids in the nursery, are you serving them spiritually? Or are you just making sure they don't die? <laughs> are you loving them? Are you engaging them? With him? Are you passing down spiritual truths or are you just watching them? When you lead a Sunday school class, are you just teaching a lesson? Or are you providing spiritual leadership and spiritual care as you shepherd a group towards maturity in Christ? When you greet people at the door, are you just shaking hands or are you making people feel known and welcomed into God's family? And you need to do spiritual work as they met physical needs? Is that how you think about serving the church? Now one last thing I want to point out in these verses. Not only did they create multiple categories of leadership, but look at this. They also had multiple leaders in each category. So how many apostles were there? Twelve. And how many new servants did they appoint? Seven. So multiple categories of leadership and multiple leaders in each category. And here's why I point this out. And if there's a part of the sermon that I would cut, it might be this one, I'm sorry, but just, I realize we're running short on time. Over the last hundred years, a lot of churches, a lot of denominations, including Baptists, have adopted a, a model of church leadership that's referred to as the pastor as CEO model. And it's not like a derogatory kind of thing. Here's what it means. 
The, th the thinking goes like this. For any business or any organization to function smoothly, it needs a leader. As someone at the top who bears final responsibility and makes the final decision. And so the pastor is in charge, but then there's some kind of board of directors or deacons that exist to, to advise the pastor and keep him in check. Now, obviously, there's wisdom at play in that kind of format. There's a reason it's such a common system in businesses and in church. But the question is, is that the leadership system we see in Acts 6? Is there a single individual at the top with a body of leaders behind him, supporting him, and keeping him in check? No, that's not what we see. What we see is two different offices with two different purposes. And they don't check and balance each other. Each group is checked and balanced by having multiple people of high character appointed by the congregation into the group. Now as the church forms throughout the book of Acts, as you read further into the New Testament, you see these two offices of leadership that they get labeled pastor or elder and deacon. And in every instance, elders and deacons are plural, referring to multiple leaders in each category. Now as we look to verse 7, once the church has the leadership it needs, as priority prioritizing both spiritual needs and physical needs, what's the result? Point number three. A healthy church with qualified leaders blesses the body and advances the kingdom. Blesses the body and advances the kingdom. Verse five says, when, or, or what they said pleased the whole gathering. Everybody was happy. When was the last time that happened at a church business meeting? So, so the body is blessed by this decision. This is a win for the church. We've got a plan for our spiritual needs. We've got a plan for our physical needs. This is a blessing for the body. And verse 7 shows that it was also a win for kingdom advancement. Verse 7. And the word of God continued to do what? To increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Did you notice what Luke just said? Many of the priests, the church is now expanding, not just among the common people of Israel, but into Jewish leadership. I really like the way one commentator summarized this point. It says, the building up of the body should not take away from reaching the lost. These are the church's two basic missions. Build up the body, reach the lost. The way we articulate it here at First Baptist Sparta is glorify, grow, go. We glorify God by doing two things. Laboring together for the growth of all believers, building up in the body of Christ, while going with the gospel locally and globally. And we can only fulfill our purpose as a church to the believers in our church and to the lost world when people are stepping up and using the gifts God has given them to serve people physically, and spiritual. So the question for you today is this. So what? Are you maturing in your faith so you can contribute to healthy church growth? Are you maturing in your faith so you can contribute to healthy church growth? You know my favorite thing about watching my kids grow up? They can finally help out around the house. Amen? Now if they don't grow, they can never help. Like, if they stayed a baby forever, like, Jane contributes nothing to our house. She, she only takes resources. Some of you in the church only take resources. You're not mature enough to give anything back. It's as they grow, it's as they get stronger and more coordinated and more responsible, then they're able to help with more and more things. And it's a sad state of affairs in the church when people can't step up and lead because they don't prioritize their own maturity, their spiritual maturity. They aren't growing in their faith. You have a responsibility to grow in your faith, not just for you, not just for your own personal relationship with Jesus, 
but so that you can contribute to health and growth of the body. All service in the church is spiritual service. It requires spiritual people. People who are trustworthy, people who are spirit-filled, and people who are wise. And so the longer you stay stagnant, the longer you stay complacent, the longer our church stays stagnant and complacent. But as you grow in your knowledge and understanding of the Bible, in your knowledge and understanding of the gospel, in your prayer life, in your discernment of people's spiritual needs, as you grow, you become more and more capable of contributing more things to keep the body healthy as it grows. Listen to how Peter describes this pursuit of, of maturity. We'll close with this. 2 Peter chapter 1. Make every effort. Now does that sound passive? No. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge. And knowledge with self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. And steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. And brotherly affection with love. That's a lot of supplements. Here's what Peter's saying. Don't ever grow complacent in your Christian life. Always be growing. Always be adding to your spiritual maturity. And here's the key thing I want you to see. Why does he say to do this? It's in the next verse, verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. Do you want to be ineffective and unfruitful for the kingdom of God? Do you want your Christian life to have no impact because you spent the entirety of it sitting on the sidelines? No, we, we want to make an impact. We want to be effective and fruitful. And the way to be effective and fruitful is to strive for spiritual growth. Not for its own sake, but so that you can effectively and fruitfully Contribute to the health of the body as it grows. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we want to be a church like the church in Acts. Not a, a church that is absent of problems. That is impossible. But a church that is able to solve its problems by appointing new leaders and new ministry activities and ministry leaders who are mature enough to handle the load and carry on the ministry and carry out the ministry into the community and into a lost world. Help us to grow individually and corporately so that as needs arise, whether physical or spiritual, we have the people and the gifts to meet each need so that Christ might be glorified in our church and in our community. May we not be lazy. May we not be complacent. But may we make every effort to grow into the Christians and to the people that your spirit has the power to make us to be. As we sang earlier, Lord, we, we declare it is not we, it is not I who does this, but Christ in me, Christ in us. So we, would we not strive in our own effort, but strive dependent on the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray these things in Jesus' name.